Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you for your word that you have for us today. We thank you, Jesus, that you are more than enough for us, that you are actually all that we ever need in our lives. We thank you so much for that. Holy Spirit, this is your place. This is your role. You work through me. You speak for me. And you know what? You open each individual person's eyes in here and in who watches this sermon. And that you open their eyes to help renew themselves to Jesus. Show us Jesus. We want to see him. We want to get eat and feast on him more and more each day. And we thank you so much for doing that for us today. And I pray that as you're with them throughout the week, that you help them to see not themselves, but see Jesus. And get them so focused on him and transforming them. And that we may be turned to see as a church of hope, not a church of destruction and condemnation, but a church of hope, peace, and love. And thank you so much for that, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. So, we've got an exciting series starting today. We have a series called Jesus, I Am. Now, a couple weeks ago, I got to finish a sermon with all the seven I Ams, and tears were flowing, which is good tears. This is great. So if you start to get a little teary-eyed today, it's okay. Now the rule is, don't hug on somebody until they're all done. Alright? <laughs> Just give me some basic rules. Let them cry out to God. And it may, it may be good tears, it may not be sad tears. Just let them get it out, and once they get out, we can all hug. We can have a big group hug afterwards if you want to. But, we're going to look at Jesus I Am. The next three weeks, each service, we're going to capture one thing about Jesus as he said, I Am. Now, in two week, next week, though, in the evening, or the morning sermon, we're going to have two of them, because two of them actually go together, so we're just going to have to roll with that. You just have to forgive your pastor for this. And it just means it's going to be an extra long sermon. Ha! Got y'all. But today's going to be long, too. And it's going to be good long, because there's a lot to eat, because he is the bread of life. We're going to really check out why he said, I'm the bread of life. Because you know what? It's actually the first thing he said when he started declaring himself, I am. Now, up to this point, I'll, I'll clarify. He said, I am twice in, in, in chapter 4 and chapter 6, later on, earlier. But he says, I am. But this is the first time he says, I am the real life. It's actually our foundation of who we are as Christians. That's why he said it first. Now you'll start to see a trend as we keep going, as you start to look at these they go in order about our Christian lives and how we grow in Him. I think it's beautiful how He does. I'm telling you, man could not have written this book without God. Period. Because man is put in there perfectly. Now, what you also see in those two, and I, I, I've asked people, I ask people all the time, when you got saved, what, what book of the Bible did you start reading? You know, nine times out of ten, or even ten times out of ten, they say? The Gospel of John. You want to know why the Gospel of John is so special? Because John wrote and showed people that Jesus is God. He actually describes and shows you who Jesus is. Per perfect. I mean, every shade, side, everything. So much that his, Bible, his book probably they couldn't cover it all. But it's something for here on earth that we can have, right? He shows us that. And it's so beautifully written. I think it's so poetic. Who? The, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? The boastful God. But you'll find out, especially this evening, how... He actually went deeper in his other epistles, too, about a little another I am about Jesus. I love that portion of it. So we'll go. We'll go. Actually, we'll go to Exodus first. Because I want to show you something. Because to the Jews, you have to understand, when Jesus starts making these I am statements, it starts to upset the Jews a little bit. Now, I just want to forewarn you. It upsets them. Why? Because in Exodus 3, Moses said to God, Behold, when I come to the Israelites, and I'm right, Moses was called by God to be what? The deliverer of Israel, uh, Egypt. Hmm. Picture of Christ, right? Picture of Christ. Knows that he is the deliverer. And guess what God is going to say to him? He says, Say to him, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. He's talking about Israel. They say to me, What is his name? What shall, what shall I say to them? God says to him, reply, I am who I am and what I am, and I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent you. I am. Right. The deliverer. The deliverer. He is a picture of Christ. Deliver us from the bondage of sin with the blood of the Lamb. And he's come to claim to them, I am. Notice that. I am. Starts off being delivered with I am. This is going to be huge with it, realizing how he's the bread of life. 
okay? So we go, we go to John 8, and Jesus makes the same statement. Now, he said this before this twice, but this didn't have the ripple effect that this had. This right here, the Jews were getting ready to kill him. They picked up stones to kill him. They were pissed off about him. So we go to John 8. Your forefather Abraham was extremely happy at hope and prospect to see my day. And he did see it and was delighted. When was this? When he took Isaac up the hill, the father and son with the rope, with the wood on Isaac's back, picture of Christ and the father, the son and the father going up the hill to make the sacrifice. And when he was getting ready to make the sacrifice, God says, Abraham, Abraham. I love that he said it twice, man, twice. And Abraham turned around, and there was a ram caught in the thicket, a mature ram caught in the thicket on Mount Calvary behind him. And this is how he saw his day. He saw Jesus on the cross. So, he speaks the truth. Now, I love how the Jews are kind of confounded. That's funny how God himself was before them, and they couldn't even see God. How many times have y'all read the book of John, the Gospel of John, and didn't really, and God's declaring who he is, and we never even picked up who he was. We didn't believe him at his word. No, well, you know what? So you can't discredit the Jews for that, because we all have all done the same thing. So, they said, the Jews, the Jews said to him, you are not even 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? Ah, he's replied, I show you what's on me, I tell you. And this is so beautifully poetic in the, in the Greek. I surely tell you. Before Abraham was born, I am. You know what this one? They picked up the stones and we're going to stone him. You know what's funny about this? He walked in the midst of him. Just, just walked him. They couldn't touch him. Now, I want to tell you this, and we'll talk about this later. This chapter starts off with a woman in the middle. It ends with Jesus in the middle, and they couldn't touch him. Could not touch him. They couldn't lay hands on him. They couldn't pick up the stone and hit him with a stone if they wanted to, because they couldn't. He's the great I am, right? So, we look at that, as we saw a couple weeks ago. Jesus I am. These are all the I am's that he says, right? Now, this one here says, I'm the vine. He also says, I'm the vine dresser, all one, right? We'll get into that later, later on. But today, we're going to stick with the first one. I am the bread of life. Remember how I said that Moses is a picture of Christ the deliverer. And he was coming to proclaim what? I am. All right? It's going to be very important to understand that, okay? So, let's get to the portion here because this is fun. Now, before we get into that, what city was he born from? Y'all know? Who, where was Jesus? What, Jesus where, what, what city was he born in? Bethlehem. 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 In Hebrew, it means house of bread. Beth means house. La means of. And ham means bread. House of bread. It's so funny. He came out first off from the get-go. He says, I'm the bread of life from the get-go. When he was born, his, his, his birth signified your completion in life. Bam. Right from the get-go. How amazing is God, man? From the get-go, he's been playing I am. From the very beginning. God is not reactive. He's proactive, I'm telling you. And this was prophesied. You actually go back and know where he was going to be born at. God spoke this out to the prophets. So let's go to John 6. Now, to give you understand this picture here. The day before this, Jesus fed the multitude, right? With the fish and the in the in the, the bread, right? And then it was late at night, the disciples went across the river, across the Sea of Galilee, I mean. They got caught in the storm, Jesus come walking on the water. And we'll get to that one story. But they get across, right? They got across. And this is the next day. So the next day, they wake up. All the people who got fed, where's Jesus at? And so they saw, oh, he went to the other side. Let's go on the other side. So now they approach Jesus on the other side. So now Jesus is going to confront their coming at him the wrong way. Right? They come at him the wrong way. They almost think he's like a food truck. Oh my gosh. We're like, they're on like Twitter. They're like, where's Jesus going to be at? We can get some free food today. Now, just picture that. That's what they're doing. It's like, hey, you're going to be where? I'm going to be downtown Third Street and, and, and Main, Third and Main. I'll be down there, right? Let's get some bread, right? They were thinking about free food. They're thinking about their belly. How many times do we think about that? You know, it's like, I have my belly. It's, wow, oh, man, you got free food? I'm there. <laughs> it's just a hey, $5 charge. You're like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm on some free food, right? Sometimes we have, let's check this out. And I'm going to say, I'm guilty on that one. You got free food? I'm there. I already <laughs> right now. 
So if anybody has any open um, cookouts that are free for me, I am automatically there. So your pastor will be there. So. Verse 26. So Jesus answered them, I assure you most solemnly I tell you. Huh. Again, he says the same opening line again when we just read. You have been searching for me, not because you saw the miracles and signs, but because you were fed with the loaves and were filled and satisfied. It's talking about the physical hunger, right? He knows there's something deeper. Just like the man that pulled Bethesda, who was here, who was crippled by birth, and he was sat there for 38 years. That's all the whole nine sermon. But Jesus healed him. Do you know that Jesus came back for him? He came looking for him again. And he said he disclosed who he was. Because I'm Jesus to him privately. Why? Because the healing is not what he needed. Actually, and truly what he needed. It was a deeper issue. But he had a sin issue. Well, he's talking to these people. You think your belly is an issue. No, it is a spiritual hunger that you want. And this is what we need to fill. This is what I, I have come to fill. I'm from the house of bread. I have come to fill that. So watch him say this. So stop toiling and doing and producing for the food that perishes and decomposes and the using, but strive and work and produce rather for the lasting food which endures continually unto life eternal. The Son of Man will give you this. I love that. He will give it to you. Did he say you, you will get it? He says he will give it to you. Now, I want to say something right now. We're going to get this clear. The seven I am's is not about you serving the seven I am's, it's about the seven I am's serving you. Bread can't, you can't serve bread. The bread serves you. If you eat bread, it's to fill your body, body, your belly, and give you energy. So in a way, it serves you. Okay? Now, I want you also to notice that when Notice that that kind of, it's hard for us to understand. It's making bread, but we just go to the store and buy it, right? But you know this was labor intensive back in the day? I want you to kind of get an idea. It took work to make bread. It took a lot of work to get their food. Shoot, to even get water, they had to go to their own well and go down and lower the thing down. And hopefully there's water and lower long, lower enough to get the water out and then pull it back up, right? It was labor intensive. It took what? Work. You're going to start to notice how Jesus comes and changes the whole system around. Amen. So, which endures and continue life, that some man would give you that. For the God the Father has authorized and certified him and put his seal endorsement upon him. Him. I love this. He's, he doesn't come out and say, I'm Jesus. Hello, believe in me. Right? He's leading them along because they have this blinders on. They can't really see him. They can't see him. They have the law. They have this work mentality. Because watch. Then they then said, what, what are we to do that we may habitually be working the works of God? What are we to do to carry out what God requires? So, is there more law you want us to keep? Jesus, you want us to keep more law so we can produce more miracles and we can do all this stuff? You want us to do that? Oh, we can do that. Oh, we all we won't have it. That kind of sounds like Mount Sinai to me. It really does. It's this work mentality. Now, notice this. They come at him with works. And how does he respond? How do we do these good, great works? Jesus replied, this is the work that God asks of you. Take note. Write this right now in your Bible. I want you to stamp this and put this on your forehead so you wake up in the morning and know exactly what you need to do every day, right? That you believe in the one whom he has sent. Did he say go and work? Go, go make sure you don't commit adultery. Go make sure that you, know, you pray five times a day, read 20 verses today. Go and do this. Go help the poor. Go do this. No, he said believe. That's, it. That's the only requirement God has. Is believe. Believe. That's it. Now this believing gets you what? We're going to find out what it gets you. That you cleave to, trust, rely and have faith in his messenger. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then? Well, how many times do we keep asking God for signs and miracles, don't we? When he says, I am. I am. We're like, give me a sign and miracle, God. He says, no, I am. It's like Paul. Paul says, please make it stop. Please make it stop. And God goes, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Jesus is enough for you, Paul. What more do you want? A sign of miracle. No, Jesus is enough. It's all you need. It's all you ever need. We get like that, don't we? Sign and miracles. Give me a sign, Lord. Ah. He says, Jesus. That's it. Please to him. Sign, will you perform this so that we may see it 
and believe it. How? Wow. So seeing is believing to these people. I like what I love what Jesus said. Thomas, blessed are those who don't see but still believe. Yeah. That's you and I. And that's how he treated the two disciples in the road of Emmaus, did he? He made them, what, see him in the scriptures, though. Not physically see him, but see him in the scriptures, and they believed, right? See and believe, and rely on here to you. What supernatural work? Work have you to show what you can do? Wow, really? He just fed you people the, next, the day before with five, five loaves and two fish. What more miracle do you need to know that he is God himself? How many times do we have to sit and ask God, show me who you are? When he already has de came and declared who he is. He has. He has. So, Jesus, I like Jesus' response. Our, they, they, they keep going. Our forefathers ate the man in the wilderness, as the scripture says. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Yeah, he gave them bread. Yep, 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 yep. So, you know, what are you going to do, Jesus? <clears throat> Last time I checked, he lifted the five loaves of bread and said, thanks, God, and broke it. And gave it to the disciples, and they broke it. But Jesus said to him, I assure you, Simon, I tell you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. Notice that the bread is capitalized here. It is in the Greek. He's talking about himself. What Moses gave you was not the bread from heaven, but it's my Father who gives you the true heavenly bread. He keeps going. For the bread of God is he who comes down in heaven and gives life to the world. So now he says this bread gives you life. Gives you life. Not just to you, Christian. To the world. The world. Cosmos. Understand that. We're not against the whole world, are we? We're against a system. Or, or I say a belief. But we're not against people, are we? Why do we go act like that? He says, I can give life to the world. Amen. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread there always. Always. Always, please. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Amen. Woo! That, that, he could just stop it right there. He could just end it right there. I am the bread of life. I'm here. Here I am. Get ready to get my hands and my feet pierced. Get ready to get my flesh ripped off for you. It would be enough. But do you notice that they didn't see him as enough? Hmm. Right? Because they keep going. He who comes to me will never be hungry. Okay, good. Eat bread, you'll never get hungry, right? It fills your stomach up, right? Let's think about this naturally. Eat bread, it fills your tummy up. Get it. He who believes and cleaves and trusts and relies on me will never thirst anymore. Ho, 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 ho. Jesus, you tell me if I eat bread, I won't go thirsty? Last time I checked, that bread sucks all the moisture out of my mouth, and therefore I had to drink something to get it down. Right? Ah, it's much deeper than that. We're gonna, I'm going to show you that. We're going to keep going to that. Notice he says hunger and thirst no more. It's a two part to this. It's two parts to this. And he's going to explain these two parts. We just got to take the time to actually read it. Right? Allow him to show us these two parts. Now, so now there's one. But as I told you, although you have seen me, you still not believe and trust in me. They're still looking for a miracle, outside miracle. They don't see him for who he is. He just said, I'm the bread of life, people. I'm the bread of life. Eat. Where's your forks at? Where's your knives at? Eat. Come on. Peace. He says, just believe. Isn't believing eating the bread? Same thing. He keeps going. But we go, we drop down a little bit because it kind of goes back and forth. Obviously, we got a lot of scripture to go through, so it kind of compresses it. I encourage you to go back and read. Because there's a lot of stuff there. They kept asking, notice this. Notice that this group of people kept asking. Now, I want to say to you, they called themselves disciples of Jesus, because you'll see this later. They thought they were disciples of Jesus. They, they called themselves disciples. Now, notice, too, Jesus never called them. He only called the 12. You'll see how the 12 responds to Peter, the one who tried to follow him, without being called. If you were called, right? They kept asking, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? Whose father and mother we know? How then can he say, I have come down from heaven? Man, how often do people around you, your own friends and family, when you got saved and you started getting changed and you started to latch on to grace and, and put away your works, 
how people around you don't be used to stealing stuff out of my purse, and you know, you used to be this, you used to be that, right? They always stuck on the has been. They don't see the new. Notice that these people are stuck on him in the physical form. But he's much deeper than that. We, we read scriptures to only see the surface level. But do we want the meat and potatoes that comes underneath? We need the Holy Spirit, right? No, they said do this. And Jesus answered, stop grumbling. Kind of a little harsh there. He was a little harsh on them. In saying these things against me to one another. They were saying this to himself, to themselves. They weren't saying this to Jesus. God interrupts us. And this should be a clue to him that this is God. They were a distance from him. And they're grumbling to themselves. Jesus didn't hear them physically, but he knows their what? Their heart. He knows their heart. That should be a clue. This must be God. There's something different about this guy. But it is. No one is able to come to me unless the Father sent me, attracts and draws him, and gives him desire to come to me. And then I will raise him up from the dead the last day. This bread raises you up from the last day. Knows that. God has to draw you to Himself. So if anybody who's going to say, I found Jesus, no, you didn't find Him. He found you. He drew you into Him. He drew you in. He gave you a burning desire to say, There must be more to life than this. There has to be something. There has to be something coming to you. What is it? What is it? Is there a God? Is there what? He starts to draw you in. That bread, He starts to tempt you. That smell. You, you, when you smell fresh bread baking in the oven, doesn't want to draw you to the oven. Picture that. Jesus smells so good. This bread smells so good that people of the world are smelling that. They're like trying to come closer to the smell. They keep like, man, they're so attracted to the smell. They keep getting bigger. Because frankly, I, I knew when my grandparents pulled that bread out of it, I was ready to dig in that joker. I didn't care how high it was. It smelled good, so therefore it's going to taste good, right? I'm going to get my tongue burnt a couple times. But it's okay. But he draws them in. This bread draws you in. It is written in the book of the prophets, they shall be taught of God. Woo. Have him in person for their teacher. Well, he just broke out the scripture. He just spoke out the law. He actually showed the true nature of it. It's that God is the one who has to come and teach you. This bread is, has to teach you. You can't learn about God without the bread teaching you. By it, what? Filling your stomach up and filling your, taste, your thirst buds up. And therefore, you'll know truly who God is. They saw God as a religious way to get to him, right? Works. And sometimes you do good, you get good. But if you do bad, he's a pretty harsh guy. But if you eat bread, it fills you up, and you'll never thirst again. That sounds like God's goodness, does it not? How many of us, I, I, I'm going to say this right now. How many of us are, are satisfied with part, with part of our lives? Raise your hand. Are you satisfied with part of your lives? Raise your hands. See that. Now, raise your hand or are you, are you completely satisfied with your life? I don't see hands. Maybe we need to eat more of this bread in more areas than just the areas that we're satisfied. And I'm going to show you something. This completely satisfies you. It, it fills every little gap, every little thing. When you're crying out, Jesus is enough. I'm satisfied. I don't need the bigger house. I don't need the bigger car. I don't need the best phone. I don't need the, my bank account stacked up to here. I have Jesus. I don't need 20,000 kids. I don't need the best looking clothes. I don't need my hair looking nice. I don't need, you know, all this entourage. I don't need to go hit the clubs to look like I'm popular. I don't need to be on TV, on radio to look so good so people like me. Jesus is enough. It's pretty satisfying. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Bible comes to me. Which does not imply that anyone has seen the Bible, not that anyone has ever seen it, except he who was with the Bible, who comes from God, he alone has seen the Bible. I assure you more solemnly, you, I tell you, he who believes in me has eternal life. Now, let's find out what the eternal life is. I am the bread of life. Life is Jesus. Colossians 2 tells us that we were dead in trespasses. We were dead. Even Ephesians 2 says we were dead. 
but God gave you life. Now, it may, it's, it's interesting to me that Jesus chose to first say he's the bread of life. First, out of all the seven major seven I am statements, he said, I'm the bread of life. Why? You got to have life first, right? Because otherwise you're dead. How can God teach you anything if you're dead? Right? You got to have life for him to teach you. No, it's I'm the bread of life. That gives life the living bread. Your forefathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. You strive so much to eat and fill your, fill your life with stuff that's around you in this world, and yet you still just die. Stars knows how he's putting this together. He's giving them two examples to understand. If you have eternal life, it means what? You don't die. You don't. You just keep living. Yeah, you keep living. So you fill yourself up with all this other stuff, you're going to die. But if you eat me, you'll live. Life. But this bread that comes down from heaven, so that anyone may eat of it, never die. Man, how many times do you got to keep saying this, man? These people just didn't get it. How many times did you read the Gospel of John and didn't know that the God, God, Jesus was sitting and telling who we really are? How many times did it take you to read it? Probably several times. I remember the first time I read this book, this gospel. I had no clue. It was woof. Right? I myself am this living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, how do you eat? How do you eat? You believe in him, right? This is how he just said. Who believes in me will have eternal life. Who eats me will never die eat of this bread, he will live forever. And also the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Why is this flesh? It's not like communion now, no one. <laughs> what is this bread really? The cross. It's really his sacrifice, is it not? His sacrifice gives us life. Because he took our death and he gave us life. There was a big switcheroo. I love that saying that. What's up? Get switcheroo. But there was a big switcheroo. He took our place and he gave us his place. He went and died the death that we deserve, actually, that could not pay for our sins anyways. But he stepped in, became the overpayment, and he said, Here's life. Life more abundantly. It's yours. He's talking about the cross. He's telling them what he's getting ready to do. You know what's so funny about the Gospels? Jesus talked so much about going to the cross and dying, and they still didn't get it. How many times we sit there and look at the cross and we're like, oh, yeah, it's the cross. But yeah, it's our bread. It's our life. He said, I'm the bread of life. I had to die so you can live. Last time I checked, the grain dies. It gets grounded up and turned to flour. It dies. Yet it turns into your nourishment, does it not? It turns into nourishment. You eat that. You get a nice big turkey sandwich. It has nice good bread on it. It fills your belly up. It gives you nourishment. That grain had to die to nourish you. He's telling them, I have to die so you can have life. He's already telling them. This death. Then the Jews angrily, man, they came pissed. Man, they were upset with him now. Contended with one another, saying, how is he going to give us his flesh to eat? Oh, man, come on, man. And Jesus said to him, notice, they're talking to themselves. They weren't talking to Jesus. Notice how God steps in. I know your thoughts of your heart. I know what's going on here. And Jesus said to him, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, you cannot have any of life unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Unless you appropriate his life in the saving merit of his blood. Unless you fully understand the cross, you can't be saved. You're just going to look at it. Oh, another man just died on the cross. Excruciating pain. That's it. No life for you. Death. Sorry. Unless you eat it. You eat it by what? Believing. You know what? We take communion every, every service to do what? We don't do it religiously to get saved over and over again. We remember what this bread has done. He who feeds on my flesh 
and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. On the last day. I love he said the last day. You think that's just end. That's end. No. He said, no, this is when time stops. Time ends and forever begins. It's, it's just like, man, I was, I was looking at this scripture yesterday, and I love it. Isaiah 54, 8 says, I hid my face for only a moment. A moment. A moment. Understand that. A moment. From the time Adam said that Jesus died Christ, God said that was only just a moment. But my love endures forever. Oh, man, Lord. The last day. Time. Now it's just, it's just one day. But eternity is forever. And that's why I'm For my flesh is true and genuine few food. What do we feed on every day? Well, every time we come here, we feed on who? Jesus. If we're looking at feeding on our own selves, man, it looks kind of ugly, don't it? But if you feel on Jesus, the food, do not get hype. I'm sorry, I get hype, man. I feel like I can go spit 20 bars or something on a song, but you know, I ain't going to rap. But I'm ready to go preach the gospel, man. I'm ready to go tell somebody else about this real life. Just like I saw on Friday. I saw y'all go out there as a response of eating your bread and come out and tell other people about the bread. And you know what? There's other people feasting the same bread that we are showing to and pointing to them. And then, guess what? They go home and now they're saying, hey, real life. It lives. It's living. It lasts forever. So like, remember I told you about the macaroni and cheese homemade mac? Stop trying to cover your face as you eat. Tell people it's good. Don't be scared. Don't be scared about your relationship. Tell people about it. Let's influence people. Show them the bread. And my blood is true and genuine drink. It is the best thing. So why are we trying to hide it? Jesus was come out. He proclaimed it. Church, proclaim it. Proclaim it to the people. Don't hide it. Proclaim it. Jesus said, I am. So guess what? We need to say, he is. And guess what? When we start to realize this, we start becoming what? bread of life to the world. They come to the church because you know what? We his body, are we not? So we reflect him. If he's the bread of life, then what are we? The bread of life to the world. So why are we hiding him? Let's show him off. Isn't he the best thing ever? If you truly, do, if you truly believe that, then tell people about it. He who feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood dwells continually in me. Woo. And I, in like manner, dwell in him. You become one. This bread makes you one with God. And there's scripture on that, baby. There's scripture that says, you're one with God. You were separated, and you ate the bread, now you're one. Don't deserve it. Sure did nothing to earn it. Grace. Just as the, the living father. Oh, I love that. He said the living father. How He's not dead. He's not like your forefathers who perish. No, they're talking about the forefathers. He says, no, your living father has sent me. And I live by, I love this, the father. Even so, whatever continues to feed on me, Whoever takes me for his food and is nourished by me shall in turn live through him because of me. You know what he just told us here? This bread of life is our foundation. This bread of life is our right standing with God. This bread of life is what gets us to heaven. It's, it's it. This bread of life is the foundation. Jesus is our righteousness, is he not? 1 Corinthians 1.30. He's our righteousness. What does that tell you? That you can't screw it up. It's reflecting on him. This, he's saying this bread is you. I represent you before the Father. So how I am is how God sees you. That's it. This bread represents you and I. And God sees us just as he sees the bread. This is deep. He really is starting to teach people, but it's, I'm telling you right now, these Jews is just flying over their head. They're not getting it. This, he's telling us, you believe in me. When I die on the cross, you believe in me. I represent you. 
Just as the high priest represents the nation, he is our high priest and he represents you and I. As he is, so are we in this world. That's how God sees us. How good is the bread? It's very good. So how does he see you? Very good. Right? This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the man which our forefathers ate, yet died. He who takes this bread for his food shall live forever. You're going to keep trying to find fulfillment in the world? It's not going to happen. You keep trying to play this religious game and thinking that you can try to keep all these commandments? Go ahead. You're not going to live. You're never going to truly live unless you eat me. You accept my sacrifice as the Lamb of God for you. I come in and I take care of it. I came down from heaven. I stepped down to take your place. You know what? I come to fulfill the law because the law of requirement of what is death. So I come to fulfill that portion of the requirement of the law so that you and I, so you can live. So I can represent you before the Father. So that you will have eternity with me. So that I won't live without you. That's what he's saying. Now, notice what they do next. We skip down four verses. It says, what then will be your reaction if you should see the Son of Man ascending to the place where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. He's starting to find more of this bread. He's a life giver. And the flesh conveys no benefit whatsoever. There is no profit. The words that I have been speaking are spirit and life. I'll never go hungry. I'll never go thirsty. But still, some of you fail to believe and trust and have faith. For Jesus knew from the first who did not believe and had no faith and who would betray him and be false to him. He already knew. God, God already knew before he created anything which one was going to believe in Jesus and which one wasn't. Well, you know what? Even the people who wasn't going to believe in him, he knows he was still relentless to say, I'm the bread of life. So you see people in the world, he's still relentless even though they're going to forever reject him in this life here on earth. They, he's still going to say, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. As he kept on saying to him, he kept on saying over and over to his Jews, I'm the bread of life. I am this living bread. The bread that, the bread that came down from heaven. That's me. That's me. That's me. Even though they're going to do what? They're going to reject him. We're going to see that. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is grant, grant him, unless he is able to do so by his father. And this many of his disciples drew back from him. And no longer accompanied him. They went away from him. He had the multitude. This multitude, who what? Came and got fed the five, the five loaves and two fish. They called themselves his disciples. And they now left him. Now look who remains. And Jesus said to the twelve, will you go away? And do you desire to leave me? To the twelve. Now, the twelve he called. What did he say? Come. He says, come. That's all he said to him. Come. He called them. Now, notice their reaction. These other people were like, this guy's crazy. You want me to eat his flesh and drink his blood? That's morbid, man. That's craziness. And because they were just seeing what? On the surface, as he was just a man. Well, notice that what happens to these 12. Now, this is a good time that Peter actually spoke up. So let's give Peter a hand and pause. Yes, 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 Peter. Because you know what? You actually said something that was so great here. Simon Peter, Simon Peter answered. You know why he, thought he spoke most? Because he was the oldest. Lord, to whom shall we go? <clears throat> you have the words, words of eternal life. The words I speak are life and spirit. How many times have we used that there and when we feast on Jesus, we didn't want to go anywhere? Now, let me ask you, when you have been feasting on him, have you so willing to just go somewhere else? Notice that they, they, they were what? Eat him up when he was speaking. So, what, where else am I going to go? You have everything I need. Jesus, you're enough. And we have learned to believe and trust. And more we have come to know surely that you are the Holy One of God, the Christ, the Son of the living God, by what he just spoke. He didn't perform a miracle, did he? Not a lot of people were performing. He asked him to perform miracles so we can believe. Jesus spoke. 
They didn't, add, they didn't say, we need a miracle. They said, we believe you by what you say. You, this is the restaurant I want you at. How many of y'all have a favorite restaurant? You don't go anywhere else now. You sit there and eat there for a You find a new restaurant, you eat there a lot. So you know, you know what, you start losing taste and it's just come overwhelming. That's like me with Sushi King down the road. I have eaten there so much, I don't even want to eat there anymore, but I ate there so much when the first place just started open, right? We just want to eat there, don't we? We want to dine there. That's all we want to do. We get out of our bed and we're like, Jesus, I need to see you, Jesus. I need you for my day. I need, I need to eat. I need to remind myself what you've done for me. I need, I need to see you more. I need more. I need more. Keep giving me this bread. I need this bread. I need this bread. Now, notice that their reaction to the other ones was positive. Theirs were negative. They left them. Because they weren't feeding. They weren't eating. They were eating. Now, I got another story of somebody who wasn't satisfied in life. She was incomplete. I'm going to tell you right now, it's the church today. It's the church today. Wasn't satisfied. She was looking. Looking. She was. She was looking. A little different than you and I when we stop eating. Do we not look for stuff to make us happy? Mm -hmm. We do different things in our lives to try to get that what? Bring that back, that fulfillment when Jesus is all we need to be what? Fulfilled. This bread is to fill us up. Now let's check this woman out. Because it's you and I. It was, oh man, I love this. It was necessary for him to go through Samaria. It was necessary. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, to go from where Jesus was at to Jerusalem, Samaria, Samarita, Samaria, Samaria. Oh, I can't feel oh, goodness. Woo. <laughs> the Jews, the quickest way is to go through. But the Jews hate them so much, the Samaritans, so much. Kind of sounds like Israel today in Palestine, the Palestinians, right? They hate them so much that they would purposely go around the long ways to avoid them. But Jesus said it was necessary for him to go through. Why? That's you and I. We haven't been eaten. We're in the land of not God's people. And God's like, I have to come to you. Because I have to bring you back. In doing so, he arrived at a Samaritan town called, I don't even know, near the tract of the land that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. I love this. Y'all remember when Jacob was building these wells. He put these wells all over what's now present-day Israel. Think on that one for a moment. So Jesus, tired as he was from his journey, sat down to rest by the well. It was about the six hours noon. Now, let me tell you, this is the hottest part of the day, is it not? People don't go draw water. They stay in the shade. They don't get water. Just want to let you know that. Presently, when a woman of Samaria came along to draw water, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone off into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is that you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan and a woman, well, it was taboo back then to talk to a woman like that, for a drink. For the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. True. Is he speaking truth? Like, why me? Why not you? That's why I say, why not you? Because Jesus said, why not you? Jesus answered, if you had only known and had recognized God's gift, and who this is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you have asked him instead, and he would give you, you living water. Now, remember the Jacob's wells? He placed them all out, and then the, the, the surrounding enemies came in to do what? Stop them up. Well, that's what Satan's trying to do there. Is stop the what? The wells from flowing into your life. This living water, right? She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, no drawing bucket, and the well is deep, and how can you provide living water? Where did you get this living water? She's kind of puzzled. For one, this woman's by herself. So you know what? If she's coming to what? Draw water from a well at midday, she's ashamed. She's scared to be seen around people because she's just scared to hear people what they're going to say, right? She is. That's weird. How many of us do that? How many of us go to a store where you avoid people when we see people, see them and they're like, whoop? <laughs> I can tell you, your pastor is so guilty of this. 
Because you know what? I remember running to women I used I used to have one night stands with on purpose and ditched them. And I would run into Walmart. And boy, I'm like dug in. I almost like a little kid duck inside the, the clothes racks, right? I'm trying to hide. I'm like, I don't want to confront you. I'm ashamed what I've done to you. That sounds like us, don't it? It's always a shame. I can tell you my wife gets mad at me. I'm ducking her. I'm like, Grace, come over here. Grace, come over here. I don't want to come in the bedroom because you're mad at me. I don't want to pull you out. Grace, I got cookies. You know? We do that, don't we? We're ashamed of the people who we've hurt. Are you greater than and superior than our ancestor Jacob, who, was gave, who gave us this well and who used to drink for, from it himself and his sons and his cows also? Jesus asked him, all who drink of this well will be thirsty. Again, this sounds like the bread, don't it? Mm-hmm. Sounds like the bread. You eat the manna, this word outside, and you're going to be hungry still. You drink from this well, you're going to continue to be thirsty. Never hunger and never thirst. But whoever takes a drink of the water that I will give him, never, never, ooh, may, ha, ah, I can tell you, these I am's, ooh, may, pops up so much, is the double negative in the Greek, never, never. They pop up around these I am's, and you check it out for yourself. Never, never be thirsty. Guess what? You drink of Jesus, you'll never, never go thirsty. Well, I promise, and it's back in the previous one. He's, when he said you'll never go hungry, you'll never, never go hungry. You'll never, never go thirsty. Man, why does God have the double promise to us? He makes a double promise. Be thirsty anymore. But the water that I will give him shall become a spring of water welling up within him until eternal life. Who's he really trying to Who's he speaking of? Holy Spirit. The one said, Sir, give me this water so that I may never go thirsty, continuing all the way here to draw. Let me back up real quick. There was one part here. Where's it at? God's gift. Recognize God's gift. You want to know something? Samaritan, the Samaritans had their own high priest. They had their own high priest. You go back and do your history. And you will find that at this exact moment during Jesus' time, they had a high priest. You know what his name means in Hebrew? God's gift. They were pointing to Jesus. Oh, my God. That's like the, the, the Islamic book. Man, I can't think of it right now. But it all points to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. And you're going to see that tonight. Believe me, you're going to see that tonight, too, as well. But it all points to Jesus. He referred to himself like God's gift. Mm. So, draw from it, right? Continue the way he had to draw. At this, Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back here. Now, we will picture this that Jesus is getting ready to be one of his old time prophets, right? Don't point out people's sins and just say, you know, you need to repent, go back to God, right? No, that's not what Jesus is doing. God is love. Watch how loving he is. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, unless you take off your mask, you'll never know how God truly loves you. And what he's doing is helping her to what? Remove the mask. He guides us in such beautiful ways because he knows the deeper cause of this. And the woman answered, I have no husband. Do you say, sir, you have spoken truly in saying this. You're right. I love this, man. How, we, uh, how many times we evangelize, man, we just want to stick it to him. Jesus is the way, the truth, people. Right? He says, no, no, there's no, you're right. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you're now with is not, living with is not your husband. I count six men. Six, which is the number for man. And you know what? You'll find in the Gospel of John, there's so many sixes that pop up, and Jesus always shows up to be the seventh. Seven mean completion, perfection. In this, you have spoken truly. Woo, he just said, here's a cookie, like. Good job, you did good. Like, like I, almost, I was trying to look for a book today. I was trying to look for uh, Jude Smith's Life, Life is book. Trying to buy it, but nobody had it. And with whoever answered Bethlehem right, I was going to toss you the book. So I was going to toss you a cookie like you used to. You passed it on Jesus, so I couldn't get it. But the woman said to her, I love this. She starts to try to avoid him. Now, he, he just spoke so, such loving to her. Now, notice how she tried to avoid it. The woman said to him, Sir, I see on said you're a prophet. Yeah. He knows everyone. Our forefathers worship on this mountain. 
But you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where it's necessary and proper to worship. Now she wants to get into this discussion about worship. How many times do we do that with people? Oh, what? This is the way. Jesus is the way of truth now. Right? Jesus said to a woman, believe me, a, a time is coming when you will worship Father near, merely in this mountain or merely in Jerusalem. You know why? Because these are religious. In Jerusalem, you had to live by the law. It's religion. They had their own religion. Because Hebrew says, what? You've been, the worship has been purged from dead works. Now they can freely worship God. It's by grace that you worship God now. Not by your works, but by his grace. You, Samaritans, do not know what you are worshiping. You worship what you do not comprehend. We do, not, we do know what we are worshiping. We worship what we have the knowledge of and understand of. For after all, salvation comes from among the Jews. He's talking about himself. Salvation, this word, he's talking about himself. Because he is salvation. Jesus, the, mean, the name Jesus means salvation. He just said, I'm salvation to it. And a time will come, however, indeed, it's already here. It's already here. This, if you look at this in Greek, it means right here. Salvation is right here. He's telling her, I'm right here. This woman, it's so funny, chapter 3, Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, Jesus never said any of this to him. But this woman could have been living a life of adultery, going from one husband to the next. Now to a husband who's not even her husband to a man, he spills out who he is to her. Mm. But we act like Jesus to, to Nicodemus, to people in this world, won't we? And this is this is beautiful. This, I mean, this is so deep. Indeed, he is already here. I am here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking just such people as these as his worshipers. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. Oh, so now she's not skipping that. She's like, ah, no, 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 come on now, stop. Whoever you are, you need to stop here. Let's, let's go on to another topic. Because I got to find a topic to beat you. Don't we do that? We always got to try to better somebody, and they get you, beat you down. You're like, just trying to switch topics. Huh? She's trying to switch topics. Huh? <laughs> I know the Messiah is coming. He, he is called the Christ. And when he arrives, he will tell us everything we need to know and make it clear to us. Right? True statement. You know what? She just got something more than she bargained. Jesus said to him, I speak now with you. I am. I am. That's it. If, you're, you're, if you're, your Bible says any more than that, it's wrong. It's just, I am. Well, he just goes clear to her. I am the bread of life. She had six men that she'd been with, and she was never satisfied. She tried to worship a guy and never met and never came close to God. He just said, I'm the bread of life. The woman left her water jar. She left it. What did she get? She got the living water. Spring up inside her. He dropped it. She literally dropped it. This was her life. She got war because she was thirsty. This is her means for everything. And she just dropped it all. Probably broke it. Because a lot of them were made out of clay. And she dropped it. means that she shattered it. She never grew thirsty. And went away to the town. To the same town that ridiculed her and put her to shame. And she began telling the people, come, come. That don't sound like a church today now, does it? It doesn't. But she said, come and see a man who has told me everything I did. How many of y'all ever do that? Come see a man who told me this. And people are like, whoop, I'm out, <laughs> right? I got some hidden secrets. Ooh. Can't know about me. She says, he knows everything about me. And they're like, we know everything about you too. We know about all the guys you've been with. You know the one that you, you, you're with right now is not even your husband, yet you're living with him. Yeah, we know who you are. Can this be not the Christ? Must this not be the Messiah, the anointed one? Is this not Jesus? I just saw salvation and I believe and I dropped everything. I ate the bread. 
I am now satisfied. I have found my seventh husband. I have found my completion. Church, we're this woman. We've been playing these games, trying to worship God in our own works, trying to eat of the world, and trying to have fun, and in a sense of fun without God. And trying to fulfill ourselves, like we got saved, but we're like, God, you can stay over here. I still need to have my fun. I need to go tell people what they need to do. They ain't believing, but they need to work. And we give them a 20 stop process. We give them five seven. If we even give them one step process, it's still not right. It still works. And that's what we do to people. And we're about, we're, we, we are now ashamed. If not in, this, in America, we are ashamed to call ourselves Christians. I just saw a study where people are scared to say they're Christians now. It's declining to even say, I'm a Christian. What's going on? We're not eating the bread. Because you know what? No weapon formed against us shall prosper because we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So I don't care who comes against me and says, oh, he's a Christian. I'm going to go after him so I can try to sue him. Go ahead and sue me. He's my vine. He brings me my supply. He's my bread. Come on. Guess what? I'm just going to love on you. You come at me all you want to. I don't care. He saved me. He can save you too. He's the bread. He is the bread. You're not ashamed. You're not ashamed. It's, it's not by my works, but it's by grace. It's not, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. You eat the bread. It doesn't matter. Nothing in life matters but Jesus. And everything you come out comes out of you is Jesus. It overflow. He makes your cup run over. It flows out. It bubbles out. Everybody around you is getting wet. They're just getting wet too. And you're like, man, you gotta know about my Jesus. You gotta know about my Jesus. I don't care. You can come at me all you want to. Yeah, you can. You can say all this stuff. Yeah, you can try to sue me. Yeah, you can try to come in. I'm a Christian. I'm I'm, I'm God's child. I'm His beloved. That's who I am. And you know what? If you didn't know, he he's not mad at you either. You know what? He loves you. He died on the cross for you too. I want you to come with me. Let's bridge these gaps. Let's pull these people. Let's walk in the middle of all this chaos and let's pull the sides together. You know what? He died for you. This bread of life is not just for me, but it's for the world. Yep. Yep. I'm satisfied. My eyes are on Jesus. I'm eating him up every day. Yep. You know that is what happens, man. When we take our eyes off of him, we become like this woman. When we become a church like this. But when we eat, we drop the worldly stuff. It says, I'm, I'm not hungry, and I'm thirsty. I'm satisfied. And you know what? I want other people to be satisfied in life. Because even Jesus has that same message for you and I in the church. Revelation 3, 1. And to the angel of the assembly, it starts right. These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold Holy Spirit and the seven stars. He's saying, I'm your completion. I'm your satisfaction. I am enough. I'm more than enough. My, my, my death on the cross was more overpayment. So you can have, you not just have heaven in eternity, but have heaven here now. And that so everybody else can be full and have leftovers. Notice that when they ate the five loaves and two fish, that there was leftovers. But they were all completely satisfied. That was what? Now you take the leftovers and go to people who are, not, who are, who are still hungry. And you go to them, you feed them. And guess what? If they picked up those baskets and went to the next town and started feeding them, they start breaking the bread, the bread will keep breaking. Be more bread. More bread. Man, it's such a symbol. He is that bread. He is that bread of life. That, the living bread. Yeah, he died, but you know what? He's alive. I want to start acting like that. Personally, we need to start acting like that and telling people about Jesus. And the words that we then speak a life in their spirit. They're nourishment to the people who are around you. Because they're looking for that. They're going out there thinking, I have to be a celebrity to be happy in life. There's so many people like that in the world. I gotta be, I gotta have millions to be satisfied. I gotta be secure in my life. I gotta have this, I gotta have this, I gotta have this, I gotta have this. Women, men, they like just go out there and just go and go and go. And it's just never enough. Is that we were born from Mother's womb as a sinner. Separate from God. That gap. We all have that gap born. And that bread is what fills it. It's that bread that fills it. And Jesus said to us individually, and he said to the church as a whole, look at me. I'm the seventh. I'm your completion. 
Now feed on this. Feed on that. Because if you, you if you realize this, you'll start telling other people. And when you start telling other people, you start looking like this. We start to be like this to the rest of the world. The church starts to reflect this. Yeah. And everybody goes, man, I want to come to church. It's not it's not a taboo to come to church. It's not, oh, you know what? We start making excuses. No, I want to come to church. You know what? The car broke down. I will walk to church. I don't care. My shoes may run out. I don't care. I'm going to church. I don't care. Because you know what? I'm whole when I'm around other people. I need to lift them up. There they are. It's the body. It's the bread. Have you ever noticed when you come to church service, make sure, because it's not the four walls, but it's us gathered, that sometimes you may feel empty that morning, but as soon as you get here, how other people start lifting you up? They start lifting you up. We're going to talk about that, because that's the branches. But it starts to lift you up. That's what happens when we feed. We start lifting our people up. No, nobody's scared to come to church. And the, and the devil's out there looking at us. Oh, so what? He's got X on you. Who cares? Who cares? I got Jesus. If I'm so worried about the devil, then I'm not seeing Jesus as enough. You know, what's so funny is that when we look at this, we only see part of this. We're like, oh, yeah, Jesus is real life. Yep, yep. We don't see the rest. I'm going to be this for my life. Instead of allowing him to be this for us. Let him be your bread. Let him be your satisfaction. Let him be completion. Not, don't make your spouse your satisfaction. Don't make your kids. Don't make your bank account. Don't make the things you have be your satisfaction. It's him who's your satisfaction. You know what? You know what's funny when you make him your satisfaction? It says that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Full. So guess what? When he was around people, he wasn't taken from them. He was giving them. You know what's so funny? How you, you like being around somebody who's never trying to take from you? It's not fun when somebody always wants to take from you now, is it? It's not fun. They always want to take from you. You don't have anything to give. Really, in most cases, you don't have anything to give. But it's fun being around that person who's always imparting to you. When we eat the bread, we start becoming full. And we start imparting to others. We become the, the church that imparts to other people, not take. You know what's so funny? We take right now, man. We've been taking for a long time, have we not? We have. Why, why do you think the, the, the voice rate in church in the church is so high? Because we've been taking. It's the imparting. I don't care if you married the wrong person. God could turn everything to good. But we can impart. So we can told something like that. I married the wrong person. Well, you know what? God could turn out to good too. That's imparting. That's why we preach nothing but this. That's it. Here's the bread. Eat. Every day. You know what? If, you, if your best time to eat is at night, you do it. I don't want you falling asleep in the Bible. You know? And you know what? If you're tired, you go to sleep. God still loves you. If you fall asleep praying, I can tell you once, falling asleep praying sometimes the most peaceful sleep you'll ever get. Yes, it's okay. Go to sleep. Don't condemn yourself. It's okay. God still loves you. Yeah. I've had times where I've been sitting there in prayer, and little Nora sitting right next to me on the floor, and she's just a kick in playing. God goes, just go love her. I love you. I'm going to fill you up. Just love her. And I get down the floor, and she's just kicking and everything. And she falls asleep, and God goes, okay, let's come back. So what you got? What's on your heart, man? Tell him. And at that moment, I, just, I feel I, I want to get out because, you know, that moment before then, I wasn't getting it out. But that he showed that he loved me even though I had a tent to my daughter. And it just comes out. He filled me up with that love. That love is that bread. Bread. So eat every day. You don't grow weak if you don't eat every day. You grow hungry. You do. Well, his name, if you don't eat your scriptures, you're going to get weak. No, you should be hungry. You should be hungry. You should be wanting more. You should be like, I got filled up from last week. I got filled up from yesterday, man. I didn't get, I need to eat some more, God. Give it, give it to me. Give me Jesus. Go hungry. 
Jesus eat? Toy, if you have to literally get a knife and fork out before you read the Bible, I say do it. If it gets you in the mood to eat, then do it. I plan on getting a shirt that says, I'm ready to eat some bread alive and have a fork and knife on my shirt. Because you know what? That's, what? that's what we should be. We should be so hungry to eat. We should be like, I'm ready, man. Because he what? He's giving the desire to do it. The Holy Spirit's always in you sense. I want to show you Jesus. Come on, let's read. Let's read. Actually, he's the one who's going to read for you. When you open that Bible, he starts to go to town. Jesus starts popping up. So much, I can tell you when I wrote this sermon, I busted into tears. I did. And when I wrote the sermon tonight, I got slain. Your pastor got slain, right? <coughs> but it was one of the best times I ever had. Because, man, he just piled on. So good. God is so good. We just don't show it now, do we? We want to keep that bread right here. We want to keep it to ourselves. Give. The disciples broke the bread and kept on giving it. And it kept on being more and more and more and more. So dish the bread out. Don't hold it in. Dish it out. He says, you feel you satisfied. You can dish it out. Makes your cup run over. It means you're full. 